Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. In the company of the upright, in the congregation, great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of honor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has gained renown by his wonderful deeds. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He is ever mindful of his covenant. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today we are blessed to be together to worship a God who provides. And God's provision for us is eternal. That is more than just a concept of time, but a, a place, if you will, where all of God is poured into a moment. We often think about God being eternal in those concepts of time, before time began and after the end of time. But in every moment in between, God is. And all we have to do is wake up to know that presence fully with us. In these moments of worship, may the fullness of God's presence bless us, and may the peace of Christ be with you. Let's pray together. Thank you, O oh God, for welcoming us to this moment and every moment when we sense your goodness and nearness, help us to bless your name. So for a moment of time, as we pray and sing and listen and speak, we ask for eyes to see you and ears to hear you. Bless us as we worship. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you, Lisa. I'm gonna pause just a moment because my opening illustration will probably ruin what you just saw. So <laughs> I need to remember God was watching me write this. <laughs> Okay, here we go. Invariably, when I pull up to the order menu at a fast food drive through sometimes I like to speak first. It works really well at a particular restaurant in town because when I pull up to this certain spot, I'll roll down my window and I will ask out loud, what time is it? And the friendliest voice from the other side says, it's bow time. How may I help you? <laughs> Let's talk about time. There's never enough time. And as you can already tell, I've got too much time on my hands. We waste time. But it's still so important. You've heard me quote the football coach Lou Holtz before. There is never, it, it is never the wrong time to do the right thing. There are lots of songs about time. I've already quoted one, too much time on my hands. If you're at the least as old as me, you know it. But here in Ephesians, there's a word about time. Our scripture lesson is Ephesians chapter 5, verses 5, 15 through 20. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. So do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs among yourselves, singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts, giving thanks to God the Father at all times and for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So here in Ephesians chapter 5, uh, it, this passage begins, Be careful then how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time, because the days are evil. Now, generally, when if you were to throw that scripture quote around, I imagine the folks you talk with would quickly latch hold of the phrase, the days are evil. And you would have, you would quickly get neck deep in a conversation about all the things that are wrong in the world. Basically, pick your favorite axes and grind them to a very sharp edge. Our days are probably not very different than the folks hearing this letter to the Ephesians for the first time. They would have nodded their heads to this idea that the days are evil, and they would have had their own long lists of why that's so. They would have talked about um, the oppression they were experiencing, at the hands of occupying forces in their own part of the world. Uh, they would talk about uh, the desperate issues of the day. They could have matched some of the things that we say now. Um, perhaps they would have talked about um, how the differences between people were exploited rather than celebrated. They would talk about a considerable gap that existed between the haves and the have-nots. 
they would have wondered, why are people so angry? Why are they so mean? Time doesn't seem to change some things. But we have arrived at a great moment in time. Really? Is that so? If that's true, then what do we do with our accounting of the evil of these days? Because we've got our own lists that we can make about what's wrong with the world. But if we've truly arrived at a great moment in time, what do we do? What do we do with the fact that the days are evil? Well, first, let me say, don't give up. Just because there are troubles, just because there are problems, just because there are things happening that make us angry or sad or disappointed, don't give up. Don't give in to that. For everyone who believes in Jesus Christ, acquiescence is never an option. Jesus taught, you will have trouble in this world. But thanks be to God that that teaching doesn't end with that phrase. You will have trouble. But take heart. But be encouraged, Jesus says. I have overcome the world. We gather together as a body of believers. We gather together as the body of Christ who overcomes the world. So Jesus is still very interested in welcoming us to be a part of that overcoming. Welcoming us to be a part of the solution to these problems. Yes, people are mean, some people are, and it doesn't seem to be anything we can really do about it. Still no call to give up. Yes, we still encounter the problems of a racist part of humanity that refuses to accept the reality, humanity, and dignity of someone who doesn't look like them. And there's still no reason to give up. Poverty is a considerable problem, not only in the world, right here in our own town. And it seems like the system is geared toward keeping people poor rather than being of any considerable help. But there still is no reason to give up. Don't give up. Don't give in. Acquiescence is not an option. Instead, make the most Make the most of the time. Raise your hand if you've watched the movie Deadpool. Now, I just want to, I'm going to hold confession here. My hand is up, okay? <laughs> okay, now I'm, I'm disappointed in all of you, but. Um, yes, that movie is full of a lot of inappropriate humor. But there is a great speech toward the end of the movie. Um, the story is that the Deadpool is the world's greatest anti-hero. He's a vigilante. But, but the more upstanding heroes, the X-Men, want to recruit him to be a part of their group. And they can't convince him that it's worthwhile. But toward the end, Colossus, 
a giant of steel, makes this great speech. Four or five moments. That's all it takes to be a hero. Everyone thinks it's a full-time job. You wake up a hero, you brush your teeth a hero, you go to work a hero. Not true. Over a lifetime, there are only about four or five moments that really matter. Moments when you're offered a chance to make a sacrifice, conquer a flaw, save a friend, spare an enemy. In these moments, everything else falls away. That's a great speech. And it just happened to be that at the moment that Colossus says this, Deadpool decides to, let's see, how would you should we put it, um, seize the day. And he ruins it. We all have our moments that will come our way. Now here's the thing. You can't sit around just waiting for your moment to happen to you as if it were to miraculously um, fall out of the sky and land in your lap, wrapped up in a pretty package, and the tag says, this is your moment. It doesn't really work that way. We always have to be prepared for our moment. Because you don't know when it's going to happen. Time management over the last 30 years or so, has begun to be presented to people as a science. I can't prove that, so maybe it's worth a project. Um, time management has been, been presented to us almost as a science in, in a way that really tries to help us be better prepared for our moment. The, the simple rules of time management are that there are things that you can take care of on the front end, the things that you know about, the things that you can be prepared for, because the real work you do will always happen in the interruptions. And there will be interruptions. Ministry takes place in the interruptions. Now we can be doing all the things that we're supposed to be doing if we made ourselves a good to-do list, and calendar things and, and appointments and managed our time really well. And we wouldn't know it when it happened, but we would be prepared for our moment. We talk about those, those uh, simple matters of our discipleship that, that we really should be doing. Uh, the acts of, of reading our Bibles, of praying, of, of spending time in worship and fellowship, of growing together, these things are essential. But by themselves, they may not amount to very much. But these are the little things that add up that help prepare each of us to be the right person at the right time when our moment comes along. It's always, it has caught me by surprise at least twice over almost 30 years of ministry that someone has come up to me and said, I want to say thank you because something you did for me really made a difference. Thank you for being there for me. One of those times I had to peek up from the kneeler at my ordination and go, really? <laughs> We can't sit and wait for our moments to happen to us. We can't stop and wonder, is this, is this my moment? Well, yeah, of course it is. Let me, let me give you something that's going to be the most profound thing you've ever heard. It's on firmly enchanted planted in cheek, but maybe it makes sense. Every right now, is a great time to be. Huh? <laughs> Every right now is a great time to be. 
Now you need to think about that and wonder what that means. Be what? Well, every right now is a great time to be a child of God. Every right now is a great time to remember that that's who you are. Because what this passage really begins to speak to us about is not how we can pull out our day planners and, and <clears throat> run down the list and say, okay, check, 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 check. Yes, I, I am, I'm ready for my moment. Um, that's, that's really not what this is getting at. Um, to live as, as wise people and not unwise. To make the most of the time because the days are evil. Making most of the time really challenges us to recognize that we live this life, that we're taking advantage of a great time to be in relationship with God. Relationship is the key. As it comes, as, as it applies to relationships, and maybe uh, especially with our relationship with God, uh, the factor of time tends to um, tends to come into play here. Because a relationship is something that we can put off to later. Or a relationship is something that we can set aside so that we can have other kinds of moments. And when we think about it, it's not satisfied until we make the most of the time that we have with God. And if God is eternal, as we talked about earlier, existing before time began and existing beyond the existence of and every moment in between, then God's presence in our relationship with God is also eternal. For every moment in between those times when we wake up and remember that God is with us. For every aha moment we have about our own relationships with somebody else. The eternal presence of God is poured into every second of that moment. And everything in between. Make the most of the time. We set ourselves up to encounter the eternal in every right now we have. As long as we remember that that's what it is. This is my right now, and so it is God's too. Another way of, of being able to say that is to pull this quote from Isaiah that we use around Advent time. Prepare the way for the Lord. Clear a straight path for him. That way we really are setting ourselves up to encounter in the right hands. Make the most of the time. <clears throat> Back in 2008, Madonna came out with a new song. Back in 2008, Madonna was 50. And it was back then that we looked at that and said, is Madonna really young enough to pull this off? And in the video for this song, we saw Madonna dancing a lot. And now that I look back on it, being that I've experienced what it feels like to be 50 for a couple years now, um, gosh, I should be able to do that too. Because now Madonna's 62 and she's still dancing. The, the song that came out in 2008 that Madonna did in collaboration with Justin Timberlake, who's really young then, was a song called Four Minutes. We've only got four minutes to save the world. Now what's interesting about that song is that it lasted, guess how long the song was? 
No, it's four minutes and five seconds. <laughs> but there was a radio edit of that song that was three minutes and five seconds. And you, if you didn't know, you were listening to the irony. <laughs> if you didn't stop well, that, felt about a minute short. And there was a there was a dance club remix of this song that lasted seven minutes and five seconds. But if there is an anthem for how maybe you should feel about how short life is, um, maybe it's we've only got four minutes to save the world. Um, there's a great line in, in the middle of that song where Madonna sings, sometimes what I think I need is a you intervention. When you recognize that time is short, perhaps you will invest more of your time in relationship. To make the most of the time is found in relationship with God and with others. We are created for this connection. We are created for the you intervention that happens between us and others, between us and God. So we're created to be connected, related. We're connected to fulfill this prayer of Jesus that we be one with him and others. We are created to be a contributing and participating part of the body of Christ. You've got a whole world of time to do that. It brings to mind a, a South African concept known as Ubuntu. And it's, it's too easily, uh, quickly defined as, as family or togetherness. Desmond Tutu said this about Ubuntu, my humanity is inextricably bound in yours. So that means when you celebrate, it helps make me happy. But it also means that if you are suffering or diminished in any way, it causes me to feel suffering. It causes me to also be diminished. That our humanity is shared, and very often we're not quite there yet because we need to pay attention and care for and lift up another. Our humanity is inextricably bound up in each other's. Make the most of the time? How do we do that? Well, one of the best ways is to realize pretty quickly that time is not ours. Now, when I wrote that, I accidentally spelled ours with an H. And I laughed at it because it's true. Time doesn't belong to us, and neither is it uh, confined to the measurement of watches and calendars. Eric Weiner is a celebrated author. He writes good books about travel and especially um, about when you travel the, he encourages you to try to figure out the essence of that community to which you go to. Right? So, for instance, he says, you might have gone to Greece, but you haven't really been to Greece. And the way he likes to experience other cultures is to ride the train with people. And he doesn't just do it to get from point A to point B, but to experience the people who are along for the ride with him. He recently completed a train journey across the United States. 
from Washington, D.C. to Portland, Oregon. And he called this journey Amtrakistan. It took four days, 60 hours of riding on a train. All of that feels like torture, doesn't it? Except what he did for that journey was to make the most of his time along the way. He connected with his fellow passengers and learned their stories and learned about the places they traveled through along the way by connecting with the people. He says that he got to Portland and he began to bend his arm as he normally would to check his watch. But as he was doing that, he realized that it didn't really matter if it was 10 minutes after 9, or if it was 10 after 9, or if it was 11.45 at night. The time for him was something that was well spent. The truth of the matter is that the time doesn't belong to us. If you do the Greek in this passage, the word here for time is not chronos, not the tick-tock of the clock time, but it is kairos, the word for time which is all about fulfillment. This is God's time. And we're just fortunate to live in it. Amen. And as we close our worship, does everyone want to stand as we sing to God be the glory? <laughs>
Our benediction is from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever, and every moment in between. Amen. Amen.